Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, today at our special edition Lung Cancer Living Room, coming to you live from Medscape's virtual lung cancer conference. Uh, I'm Danielle Hicks, Chief Patient Officer here at the GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer. And for those of you who may not be familiar with our Living Room Program, it's a support and education series created specifically with patients and caregivers in mind with the goal of bringing to you live and in real time educational talks from key opinion leaders in the lung cancer community. And in a format that's really, uh, you know, a format and a language that is uh, easy for you to understand. We know that people watching come from around the globe and, and consist of patients living with varying types of lung cancer. And tonight, um, or today, as you may know, um, what we're going to be discussing is the approaches to the management of small cell lung cancer. It's a very important topic that is near and dear to my heart um, and the GoTo Foundation, as well as to the heart of our speaker, Dr. Jacob Sands. Um, Dr. Sands is a thoracic medical oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. We couldn't be uh, more thrilled to have him here tonight. So um, I'm going to be mindful of time um, and we're just going to jump right in. But I think, you know, as some of you may or may not know, uh, the treatment of small cell lung cancer has remained mostly the same for decades now until very, very recently. So we're going to talk about some of the exciting things that have been happening in lung cancer, in small cell lung cancer, as well as some of the things that are coming down the pike. So before we get started, I will ask Dr. Sands just to give us a brief introduction of himself and why uh, lung cancer uh, is his main area of focus. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and uh, I, I, my name is Jacob Sands. I'm a thoracic medical oncologist, as stated. I lead the small cell program at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, and really, small cell lung cancer is, is the area of focus of, of my research work. Uh, I also do quite a bit in lung screening, uh, which obviously is a different topic. Um, so it's wonderful to have the opportunity to to speak with everyone here. Uh, I am on the, the scientific advisory board of the GoTo Foundation, which really I think as many people joining uh, know that that the GoTo Foundation has actually multiple arms and does a lot of advocacy and uh, also clinical trials research kind of, of stuff to move the field forward. So it's always wonderful to to get to be on here and speak with Danielle and and everyone else. Thanks, Jacob. We are thrilled to have you back. Um, with that, I think we should just jump right in. We've got a lot to cover today. For those of you who may be watching live, um, feel free to enter any questions you may have into the chat, um, and they'll make sure to get those questions over to us uh, so that Dr. Sands can answer them for you. Uh, and with that, uh, let's start. So let's start with a, sort of a base on a basic level. What is small cell lung cancer, and how is it different from non-small cell lung cancer. Yeah, this is foundational. But before I jump into that, I just want to reiterate, yeah. uh, please, everyone, feel free to comment. You can see Danielle sitting in uh, what is the GoTo Foundation living room. Uh, and that was always really just such a, a special place to be. And it's nice when we can all sit in the room together and have this have this discussion uh, about something for everyone. And, and so we're recreating that here online. And that really is best when, when you join. So please feel free to, to ask anything. Uh, comments, questions are absolutely welcome. So uh, so going back to what is different about small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer, you know, this is decades ago, really uh, at the beginning of understanding cancer diagnoses and to differentiate, differentiate these. Um, under a microscope, small cell lung cancer cells are smaller. And therefore, these were separated out as small cell and non-small cell. Now, um, that being said, all cancers are essentially cells that are mutated. So we categorize these in ways uh, so that we can further understand what is generally good treatment options. Um, and, and that being said, 
these cells that are mutated uh, really can be somewhat um, independent of those boxes in some ways. So each person's cancer needs to really be individually evaluated in the same way that we, we um, take into account uh, the unique uh, traits of each individual that has that cancer. But when speaking broadly, generally, um, small cell lung cancer tends to uh, grow more quickly than non-small cell lung cancer. Um, it tends to also respond very quickly to initial treatment. So the fact that it uh, grows more aggressively also makes it a bit more susceptible to those chemo agents in the beginning. And so the responses can actually be quite dramatic as well. And, and so there are different, um, uh, different characteristics uh, in each of these. Um, and I know we're gonna get into some of the specifics that we take into account in treating, in treating small cell lung cancer, but, but just generally speaking under a microscope, these are smaller cells, they look different. Uh, and, and thankfully, although it grows more aggressively, the responses to initial chemo are, also, are often um, typically quite rapid. Thank you for that. And I know um, a lot of folks who typically watch, um, you know, have, love to hear about all the new information and, the, and the, the exciting things that are happening now and coming down the pike. So I'm excited to jump into that. But before we jump into to, to that sort of treatment piece of it, let's talk a little bit about staging because Typically, small cell lung cancer is staged a little bit differently than non-small cell lung cancer. That's right. And um, I think for most cancers, we talk about stage one to four. And, and that exists for small cell too. But more commonly with small cell, we tend to talk about it as limited stage or extensive stage. And, and what this really comes down to, for the most part, is does it fit within a radiation field? So um, this, this starts out as a lung mass, a nodule mass, uh, and lymph nodes within the chest uh, can, are, are often what's involved next. Now, that doesn't, there, there's no absolute of how everything goes. So as I said in the beginning, we're talking about mutated cells. And so um, these cells can act differently. Uh, um, uh, one cancer is not necessarily exactly the same as another, even though they're categorized all as the same type of cancer. So um, limited stage being the nodule or mass in the lung and uh, lymph nodes, if they're involved um, uh, within the middle of the chest, if all of that area can fit within one radiation field that can be safely delivered, then that ends up being limited stage and typically is treated with chemotherapy and radiation together. And the goal is cure. Now, there can be very limited stage. Where, um, I mean, that's not an exact category. I'm just saying very limited in the fact that there's just one nodule, and therefore that might end up getting surgically removed. Uh, and so that, that can also be a treatment. Um, and, and, and that still is categorized as limited stage, although those cases are unusual to catch small cell that early. So typically we're talking about something that would be treated with chemo and radiation, and that ends up really being the cutoff. Extensive stage is something that is not really considered curable. Um, that's not to say that it can't be controlled for a long time, and 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 we'll get into some of the advances that have happened uh, in that setting. But uh, at least classically, this is not considered curable. Um, there are some instances of people really having very long control, and and, and some questions about maybe, uh, which which are, is exciting and, and we'll get to that. Um, so th that's kind of the general separation and the general goals of treatment. Great. Are the symptoms different for small cell lung cancer than they are for other types of lung cancer? Or are they virtually the same? You know, the symptoms are so uh, different and not necessarily entirely reliable and that I have a lot of people that come in who have no symptoms, that they just have this that showed up in some other testing. Um, a, a guy I just saw um, actually this week who has stage four disease but has no symptoms. And this was only caught because of something within with like a head and neck kind of evaluation where the, the scan for that in, uh, got the top of the lungs and showed some nodules in the lungs. And so that's what led to further workup, but he has no symptoms and said, 
gosh, is this kind of wild scenario? Because I don't really feel anything. Uh, and, and that actually certainly happens in both non-small cell and small cell. Um, small cell does tend to grow more rapidly. And so more commonly people come in because of symptoms that have rapidly developed. And in some cases that really uh, can be people coming into the hospital because they're so short of breath, they suddenly need to be on oxygen. And so symptoms can really rapidly uh, develop. Um, shortness of breath, cough, uh, especially coughing up blood, uh, that would be particularly concerning. You know, the tough thing though is that uh, often people have some degree of shortness of breath or have an intermittent cough um, anyway. That's something they've experienced before and it wasn't cancer then. Or they'll say, oh, I've had an intermittent cough for the last 10 years and now it's finally diagnosed as a lung cancer. Well, the small cell lung cancer hasn't been there for 10 years. And so uh, oftentimes the symptoms that we talk about as being warning signs for possible lung cancer are, are actually symptoms that are more commonly other stuff. And so this is part of the challenge in screening and really part of why uh, lung screening is really so important. Uh, and, and people who are age uh, 55, although more recently updated to age 50, with uh, um, the, the amount of smoking history is something calculated, but uh, you can ask your doctor about that. But if, if smoking is something that, that people have done for years, then, then they may qualify for that. Um, and this is why lung screening is so important is to really catch this when it's earlier before people are getting any kinds of symptoms. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned screening because I think it is sort of this low hanging fruit um, and this option for, especially with the new um, sort of updated criteria and guidelines for, you know, roughly 16 million people um, living in the United States today that qualify for screening. And, and we know, as you just stated very briefly, but as we'll get into um, a little bit further down in the agenda here, the sooner we can find the cancer, the more likely we are to be able to cure it. So um, I know that most people that come and watch the living room have already been diagnosed. These are people that are already living with lung cancer, but I like to remind them that it's a perfect opportunity to uh, spread the word about screening um, for lung cancer for your neighbors, your family, your friends, um, and remind them that this is, this is out there and this is available. Um, we need to get more people in the door. So we can get more people diagnosed early. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's jump in. I wanna kind of break this out and you touched on it a little bit um, into um, how small cell lung cancer is treated. And I wanna start with limited stage. Um, what role, um, and like I said, you touched on this, but what role does chemotherapy play, radiation therapy, chemo radiation, potentially surgery if that's ever an option, and um, what we call prophylactic cranial radiation. Yeah, these are so these are all different ways of treating. And basically what this comes down to, maybe let's start out with kind of the earliest. So first of all, I'll say chemotherapy is always a part of it, um, a, a part of the treatment. And I'll, I'll describe why in a moment. Uh, but if we're talking about a nodule that is found that ends up being small cell lung cancer, um, that's that's fairly uncommon, but but does happen sometimes. This is to catch it that early is extremely fortunate because, as I said, this does tend to grow more quickly. Um, but uh, if someone gets surgery and it's small cell lung cancer, even if it's in early stage one, whereas in non small cell lung cancer that would be considered it. Um, for small cell lung cancer, we would still give chemotherapy. Um, and, and some people say, well, the surgeon told me I got it all. So why would we be doing anything else? And I say, well, that's true. The surgeon is saying that we got everything we know of. Um, and, and I often will give an analogy to, to, to help with this. So uh, looking at these scans, and I still find it absolutely amazing that we can see inside people's bodies with these scans. The technology is like Star Trek. But at the <laughs> same time, it's like if we were in outer space and looking at the earth at night. And we see uh, New York City light up, we see San Francisco light up, uh, we see major cities light up. But there are plenty of towns that, that we can't see from outer space, even though there are people there, there are lights, it's just not enough to show up. 
And these scans with the cancer are the same way. With small cell lung cancer, there's a, there is a higher risk that some cells flicked off from that nodule and are somewhere in the body. We can't say that they're not there. We can't see them if they are. So we give the chemotherapy to really help eliminate any cells that remain. It's not perfect, uh, it's not guaranteed, uh, but it does increase the likelihood of really eliminating small numbers <clears throat> of cells that may exist. At the time of recurrence, um, that chemotherapy is not something that is really curative. But after a surgery, when when there when it's microscopic out there, it does uh, it does add to the likelihood of cure, and therefore is really important. Um, now, uh, now, I should say, I mean, any of these I'm discussing, this is a broad subject. So, if the decision with your doctor is different, that doesn't mean it's wrong necessarily. These are, this is where we take individuals and we make decisions together based upon what's right for that individual, not just these kind of broad categories of starting points. So if there are lymph nodes involved, uh, especially within the middle of the chest, this is uh, very common within small cell lung cancer, um, then chemotherapy and radiation is given with a goal of cure if there are no other sites of disease that, that have spread. And so um, chemo and radiation together, now the radiation is um, generally once a day, every day, Monday through Friday for six weeks, or could be twice a day, uh, Monday through Friday for about three weeks as a way of giving this more kind of more uh, condensed radiation. The chemotherapy is four cycles, uh, and that's given three days in a row uh, every three weeks, uh, essentially. Um, but the chemo and radiation is given together with a goal of cure. Uh, prophylactic cranial irradiation is, is um, a somewhat nuanced topic. Previously, the, the really, um, this was the standard of care and, and still is uh, the standard of care, uh, although now in question. Um, it was previously the standard of care because there were studies that showed that it, when a group of patients, one was randomized to um, get radiation to the brain. We say prophylactic, meaning that there's no known cancer in the brain, but you're radiating it to eliminate any microscopic disease. Just like I described with the chemotherapy, this was radiation to the brain to eliminate any potential microscopic disease. Uh, and the group that got the prophylactic cranial irradiation uh, ended up having better survival. And so that's really compelling when we see a group of people live longer because of, of something. Uh, that being said, these were older studies and there was not an MRI brain before uh, consider it before randomizing to the radiation or monitoring. And more recently, there was a study out of Japan that looked at doing MRI brain before that randomization, and then in the control group, meaning the group that did not get radiation, doing an MRI every three months. And really that ended up being, as far as a survival and uh, standpoint, those were similar. So the group that did not get radiation prophylactically did end up having uh, more cancers that showed up in the brain that were later treated, but that did not impact their survival in the longer run, it doesn't seem. Now, you know, we can get into some of the statistics of that and, and um, it, it's a little more nuanced than I'm presenting it right now, but that has certainly raised the question as to whether or not doing radiation is really so important if there's not anything known to be in the brain, or if just monitoring with scans is considered reasonable. And there's been kind of a general shift in not really doing as much of that prophylactic cranial irradiation, particularly in extensive stage disease. In limited stage disease, where, where we're really going for cure, I think there's still more of a, a, um, a tendency to give that treatment. Uh, the, the trial that I described out of Japan was in extensive stage disease, so that's not that curative intent setting. Um, so there is there is an ongoing trial in the U.S. now in both limited stage and extensive stage 
uh, for a randomization to either getting prophylactic cranial irradi irradiation or getting ongoing every three month MRI brain. And for some people, they feel strongly about either getting the radiation or not getting the radiation. And if people feel strongly about that, I think both are justifiable. Uh, for those who don't feel strongly and who say, well, you know, we're not quite sure um, what to make of all of this and therefore I'm willing to get either, then actually the trial is a great, is a great way to go. Now, extensive stage, the goal is not cure. Um, and so extensive stage, the treatment is to knock back the cancer. In many cases, it really, um, uh, in many cases, people feel a lot better after starting the treatment, particularly if they have symptoms. So I described earlier patients, some people end up coming into the hospital because they're having so much short, shortness of breath and end up having to be put on oxygen. And I've seen multiple instances where people came in severely short of breath, needing oxygen, where we start treatment and their shortness of breath improves to the point where they actually leave the hospital off of oxygen because it has worked so rapidly. Um, other symptoms that can come up, which I didn't describe earlier, can be swelling in the hands or neck and face. And that's because um, when you get that cancer in the chest, uh, it can pinch off the big vein that goes back to the heart uh, from the upper body in particular. And therefore, the blood is, is not really flowing as easily and kind of gets backed up. And that, that's where you get the swelling. Again, with the chemotherapy, that can resolve very rapidly as well. Oh, I think you're muted. I am, sorry, I had to cough <laughs> and I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, thank you as always, Jacob, for the way you are able to describe this in a way that makes sense to our patient population because I know a lot of this is very, very confusing. Um, let's jump into some of the extensive stage stuff. Um, and before we get into, um, you know, some of the trials and the exciting things that are emerging, let's talk about the role of chemo radiation and immunotherapy, which is uh, some of the newer, uh, newer drugs on the block to treat these patients. Yeah, so for decades, we've had uh, the chemo regimen, carboplatin or cisplatin, these platinum agents, uh, plus atopicide are the two drugs. Um, and that really has been the backbone, the standard first line treatment. And really what we also give when we're talking about chemotherapy after surgery or chemotherapy with radiation, it's those drugs as well. At an extensive stage where we're talking about controlling the disease, it's also these platinum and atopicide. And before I go more into this, I just want to make the point, and I, I realize most people joining have already been diagnosed and therefore have already been treated, um, but, uh, but for those who, who have not or for others uh, joining, you know, I think the general impression of the public and even many physicians not working in oncology is that uh, people believe that, that when someone's diagnosed with a cancer, that chemo is going to destroy their quality of life, but give them more time. And if that were true, then being an oncologist would be the most horrific job because you're, if that were the case, you're really just making people suffer and for longer. And that is never actually the goal of the treatment. Everything is about quality of life. And many people are actually surprised that on the chemo, they don't experience nearly what they expect to experience from side effects. That's not to say there aren't any. And, and the treatment that I just described for small cell, people do lose their hair. Not all chemo causes people to lose their hair. Um, for some people, that's a big deal. For some people, it's not. Uh, the amount of nausea uh, um, is often dramatically less, if or sometimes none at all, uh, from what people expect. I think people picture uh, what it was like decades ago. Uh, and so they expect to to really have nausea be an ongoing terrible problem. Now, that sometimes happens. Thankfully, that's fairly rare. And most people really, if they get any nausea, it's fairly mild and there's medicine that, that they take and then it goes away. Um, and, uh, and it's mild and lasts for a couple days, if, if that. 
um, as I said, sometimes there are bigger issues, but uh, but for most people, that is that is better. Now um, that chemo is given three days in a row, um, every three weeks. They do it four times and then stop. Generally, it was previously with chemotherapy, it was four to six times, and so there is a justification for cycles five and six. I I uh, really would was using doing five cycles five and six less and less, quite frankly, because I just uh, think the benefit in that really diminishes. Um, the only instances in which I would really more strongly consider that is someone who has no problems with the chemo treatment and the scan after cycle four looks really quite a bit better than the scan after cycle two. And the scan after cycle two often looks much la much better than the baseline scan. These are some nuances uh, uh, to this. But uh, more recently, immunotherapy was approved. This is a, a few years back now. Immunotherapy was approved. Um, currently, FDA approved atezolizumab or dervalumab, both given with chemotherapy. And, um, you know, we talk about the median, which is not quite the average, but we talked about the median. Now, the median isn't dramatically different when, when including these immunotherapy drugs. But the real benefit isn't demonstrated by the median. The real benefit is demonstrated by the number of people that really have ongoing control years out. And so we tend to look at these curves that show how many people have had recurrence uh, or, or, or progression, sorry, the growth of their cancer. And, um, and what we see is that the group that got the immunotherapy drug, there is a higher number of patients that have ongoing years of disease, of disease control. And I, I have some patients that really um, were in, I mean, at this point, really, we're talking to really be like five years means they've been on one of those trials. Uh, but I do have some patients that really they are years out and we're monitoring and, and doing what I call high five visits where they're coming in and their scans look great. And, and um, now, the immunotherapy, when it works, is absolutely revolutionary. It is a home run uh, drug. Um, and really, I think where where the biggest research uh, need is, is in the group of patients that don't get the benefit or better identifying who's really going to benefit from the immunotherapy and who is not and, and finding better options for that group. We We will not stop working at this until everyone has that home run, until all patients are cured. And, and there's a lot going on toward that, and there continues to be a lot of need for that, but we are getting some real wins in small cell lung cancer, which for decades has been uh, uh, really challenging. Non-small cell lung cancer, the last decade, this has become a totally new field in the last decade. Many of the drugs we're using in non-small cell lung cancer are new in the last five to 10 years. Small cell lung cancer, I think we're just starting to get these, these wins. And so the immunotherapy is a big one, but it's for a fraction of individuals. Thanks, Jacob. And I'm really glad you talked about the side effects you know, sort of profile for some of these therapies, because I do know that um, people diagnosed um, with cancer are really afraid of chemotherapy, radiation. Um, we talked about the cranial irradiation in a prophylactic way. I, I, I think it's so, so, so important, and I want to reiterate and drive home that um, it is not your grandfather or your great grandfather's chemotherapy, um, that there are um, drugs that can help um, to counteract some of the side effects. Side effects, and can you talk a little bit about what we normally refer to as palliative care, which is another word that tends to terrify patients um, at, because they don't understand the supportive nature of it. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of that when you're being treated for small cell lung cancer? Yeah, this is. I mean, this is such a huge topic, really across all of oncology for for all cancers. Um, and, and to your point, you know, this is not your 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 grandparents or great grandparents' uh, um, treatment. You know, even when the chemo drugs are the same as decades ago, 
our supportive drugs, our anti-nausea drugs are so much better that, that even the chemo that previously caused such terrible nausea and vomiting now doesn't in nearly the same way uh, because of some of these anti-nausea medications we have. You know, uh, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll f kind of flesh out a, a previous statement a bit um, in answering uh, this, this um, uh, your question about palliative care. I think the general public impression and even, even in medicine outside of uh, oncologists, um, the impression is that a cancer diagnosis is a death sentence. Uh, in some cases, actually, no matter the stage, people are, are, are of this belief um, and, and that the treatments just make their lives miserable, but they live longer. And so there, there are, I mean, reinforcing this even within what we see in movies, there's the movie The Bucket List, which is this uh, a delightful movie, actually. I mean, it's a great storyline, but, you know, it's something that further reinforces this, these preconceived ideas, which I often, in the beginning of my visits with people, I try to kind of break apart some of these preconceived ideas that actually don't help and, and, and in some ways can be harmful to people's decision making. But, but uh, uh, Bucket List is a delightful movie. It's worth seeing, but uh, you know, it's a movie where a guy gets diagnosed with a cancer that can't be cured, and rather than get treatment, he decides to go off and have his life adventures uh, for the time that he has. Um, and, and I think people are of this kind of belief that they can just carry on uh, with their life, and when it's their time, it's their time. And without a real understanding of the fact that the cancer itself actually impacts people's quality of life quite a bit, uh, and so people don't typically just have this kind of whatever time frame without symptoms, but rather the cancer itself causes problems. And so when giving the treatments, um, we're actually, the whole goal is improving people's quality of life. And there are times that the drugs themselves cause side effects. Absolutely. I, I'm not minimizing that, but rather just contrasting that with the fact that um, on the flip side of that, they're often reducing the side effects of the cancer itself or further delaying any of the symptoms that happen from the cancer itself. And so, um, so any chemotherapy or any really therapy being given is really about how much it's going to help somebody, how much it's going to improve how people feel versus any risk of side effects that may come with it. And th that you weigh that out for each individual. And there are some individuals where I would not use a certain drug because of how they are uh, or any symptoms they might have at their baseline or their normal, uh, and others where, where all options are, are on the table. Um, now, palliative uh, involvement, um, you're right. I, I think for a lot of people, well, well, there, there's such a broad range of, of what people come in with their preconceived ideas and, and understandings and, and experiences. In some cases, people think of palliative care as being end of life care. And that is an aspect of palliative care, but it's not the only thing. Palliative care really is around people feeling better. And so we we talk about chemotherapy as being palliative as well, because it's palliative is essentially focused on quality of life. And so there are um, having the palliative care service involved um, can be end of life, but it doesn't need to be. And so sometimes what I'll say is supportive oncology as terminology, where it's like, hey, we're involving other people who are really specialists around symptoms and discomforts and ways of further managing some of those. Thankfully, for most people that are getting chemotherapy, they tend to do okay with the treatments. And so having some of the, ha having palliative care involved isn't always something that's necessary. Uh, but, but in others uh, where they are having maybe a bit more symptoms or something else going on related or, or uh, th then having palliative care involved to better treat some of these symptoms can be very helpful. Yeah, I think, you know, <laughs> There are so many complexities that go into this and a couple of times you've mentioned sort of goals of care and um i think that's one thing sadly that is missing for a lot of, of patients that sort of shared decision making conversation with their physicians right where the physician's not just treating the cancer but the person so that person first type of care um, is such an important piece and clearly 
um, something that, that you, you partake in and, and you have those conversations um, with your patients. Can you talk a little bit about what that might look like or how a patient or person diagnosed with small cell lung cancer may not be receiving that, how they might go about starting that conversation um, with their healthcare yeah. provider? Yeah. This is a really challenging white one, quite frankly. Uh, and it's one where um, when I started my career as an oncologist, really in fellowship, um, I went into fellowship thinking, okay, when I meet people, we just need to establish all of this stuff. And uh, um, what, what I came to understand fairly quickly is that a cancer diagnosis is so much to process off the bat. And people come in with the preconceived ideas that I just mentioned. Um, and so, so I honestly find that, that right off the bat, what we need to do is actually establish what's real. Uh, people come in with such strong preconceived ideas. Um, and, and so some of it is really getting a sense of what they expect or what they think. And, and I do think there's a bit of a shell shock kind of a, a, a process in the diagnosis itself from the beginning. And, and so frankly, when people come in with this preconceived idea that they now have a diagnosis where their time is going to be extremely limited and the treatment's going to harm them. And when people are holding those beliefs from the beginning to then jump into end of life kind of discussion, people that, that ends up, um, it ends up unfortunately reinforcing these preconceived ideas that I think we need to first take a step back from. And so what I've found is actually to try to lay all of that out at the beginning um, uh, is too challenging. And um, what people want for their end of life care uh, is an extremely important aspect of things. So I'm not minimizing this in any way, but but rather just saying that I think People often need to get their feet on the ground first and get to a point of kind of being like, okay, I have a cancer, which as you know, just being able to get to the point of saying, of saying, okay, I have a cancer is in, in, in a somewhat unfathomable uh, amount to process. Uh, but before getting to that, uh, it can be really hard to have uh, um, real solid end of life type discussion because at the same time, I think people come in thinking that that's what's going to happen right now and, and recognizing, hey, you might very well start your treatment and do really well and, and you could go on. And I have patients who uh, a certain time frame into their treatment will come in and say, gosh, you know, I, I have days where I don't even remember I have cancer anymore, which is kind of a wild statement. Uh, um, so. So I honestly find that in the beginning, what I'm trying to help people do first is rather than have cancer be everything they think about is get back to themselves being the same person they were before they got diagnosed, getting their feet on the ground, having activities that are focused just on the cancer, having stuff they think about, stuff they accomplish, stuff they do kind of getting back a bit to the rhythm of life. Now, that's not how it goes for everybody. And there certainly is a time point at which having these discussions is overwhelmingly important. And so I'm not at all suggesting to avoid the topic, but just pointing out that as the oncologist um, and, and, and with people's preconceived ideas coming in, this is a very individual path. And so there are some people where they come in and we have these discussions. There are time points at which it's extraordinarily important to really get down to brass tacks. And that is an individual path. Um, and each individual, depending on where they're at, where their mindset is, how they're interacting, is what defines this interaction from me. One of the things I always tell people is, I will always be very direct with you. Any question you ask, I will be as blunt as I can in my answers. Um, I, I, I will never say things just to provide hope. We're going to talk facts. And there will be times that I may say to you, this is a terrible situation. Because if it is, I'm just going to tell you. 
we're not going to pretend things are amazing when they're not. I will be absolutely direct with you. And, and it also comes down to when a conversation is going to be something where you're making decisions. One of the most, maybe the most common question I get, even in the, especially in the very beginning, is essentially, how long is this going to work? How long do I have? This type of question. I mean, even in providing as blunt and direct an answer as I can, you just can't say for any one individual. And as I've said, I have people that are years out. So it's impossible to provide that. And so I'm very direct about the fact that that's unanswerable. Um, but, but when it gets down to, hey, here's the situation in my life, and I need to make some actual life decisions based upon this type of thing, then, then we talk statistics and all of this in the context of what matters for that individual. And so this end of life uh, discussions is really important within the context of each individual as well. And so um, this is, is, it's a very individual process, I guess, is what I'm getting down to. And to make broad sweeping kind of a, a, a recommendation, it just, it's, it's such a challenging subject, quite frankly. Yeah, I agree. And so personal, as you said, for each individual. Um, okay, let's jump into um, some of the exciting things that are going on. But I want to ask first, I think in non-small cell lung cancer in particular, you mentioned over the last decade or so, a lot of things have happened. A lot of new therapies, particularly targeted therapies based on biomarker status have been approved. Are there currently any biomarkers used um, in treating small cell lung, lung cancer or are any emerging? Yes. And, um, and before I get to that, maybe may, let me just summarize, because I just, you know, had a, a lot that I just said about the, this sure. uh, um, goals of care stuff. And so basically from all of that, what's important to patients? What's important to the individuals? First of all, you should feel like you can say absolutely anything to your oncologist. You should feel empowered to say anything you're thinking, to ask anything you're thinking, and to be very direct about what you would want. Understand that anytime you're talking goals of care, um, to be to have a tube uh, down your throat or to get compressions or these types of things, this is not something that would just be a blanket, uh, do it for years. So if you feel like, hey, um, I would want you to do anything uh, until the point at which um, uh, it looks like nothing further could be done, you can say that. And, and that's often what people mean. Um, so, so. Be, you should feel empowered to be very clear uh, about any of this of your preferences and also to, to ask any questions you have. And that goals of care, everything I just said, is really more from the provider perspective and the advice that I give to clinicians. Uh, and so hopefully that's helpful in your understanding as to how advocate to, to advocate for yourself. But you should feel empowered to absolutely ask or, or say anything that you're thinking. Now, to then to, to get to the biomarkers, this is a very exciting thing uh, within lung cancer now. So in non-small cell lung cancer, we have various subtypes that have been described. Um, that was uh, uh, years back. Uh, um, and, and as I said, within the last 10 years, we've had dramatic advances within non-small cell lung cancer related to different subtypes, but, but each of them really impacted by these different treatments. And within small cell lung cancer, we really just have small cell lung cancer. But more recently, there are uh, very similar proposed subtypes, really from Charlie Rudin at Memorial Sloan Kettering and out of Lauren Byers' lab at, at MD Anderson, where they both uh, um, described, as I said, similar um, proposed subtyping of small cell lung cancer. Now, right now, that isn't something that, that is uh, something that would impact treatment options. But there is more going on within small cell lung cancer treatment uh, studies then probably the culmination of everything that has previously been done, which is just to say there is a ton of research happening right now in small cell lung cancer. There are a number of novel therapies in trials. And these proposed subtypes may have a significant impact as to which groups might respond better or have, the, have cancers uh, um, that respond better to these different novel therapies. And so we'll see how this pans out, uh, but this may provide a new framework upon which 
these novel treatments will hopefully move forward and really become uh, approved treatment options. And subtyping might be a way that, that will better identify cancers that can respond to other novel therapies. Yeah, I think that's, um, uh, it is very exciting. I know um, we're talking about research now, right? And I think historically there may have been some limitations on studying small cell lung cancer. Can you talk a little bit um, about that and why they, how that may have impacted um, sort of the lack of major therapeutic advances in the last 30 years, although that's changing now? Yeah, so small cell lung cancer has been tough uh, in part because it grows so rapidly. People really need to start treatment immediately. <laughs> Um, or, or and now again, that's not true for absolutely everybody. So, uh, but but more commonly, people need to start their treatment quickly, uh, and so therefore, it can be a bit more challenging to go through the process of referral and, and enrollment to trials and such. Um, at the same time, the amount of tissue available is often quite a bit less. In that, uh, the biopsy within small cell lung cancer, uh, there tends to be a bit more of what's called necrosis, which is dead cells. And so the amount of tissue that's really available for testing is often less. Now, a lot of the genomics type stuff that has, has developed and, and really the subtyping um, has in part come from genomics testing, although the way of categorizing is just is now from stains on the surface of the cells. Uh, but but the genomics evaluation that that is uh, is done, the technology on that has really advanced quite dramatically as well. I mean, you think about. I mean, I remember when they were sequencing the human genome, and this was something that was done across many different academic centers and took years. And, and now we're able to really sequence things. Uh, with, with, I mean, in one center uh, in dramatically less time than years. So, um, so there really is a lot that's gone on from a technology standpoint that has moved the science forward much more quickly. Um, there are still some challenges for clinical trials within small cell lung cancer. And this is where um, getting referred or, or being seen at one of the big academic centers that has trials available is really important. Um, even if you've already started treatment, I would say it's still worth finding out who has trials options in the area, because at the time of progression of the cancer, um, that can be when you really need that option. And so it's just good to be plugged in somewhere where you have a sense of um, not necessarily the specific trials, because that will change with time, but the process of it so that you're kind of ready to be plugged in as needed. I think it's a really important point that you made um, yet again about um, being seen by a specialist because th there are so many variations to how you treat from a standard of care perspective, but more importantly, what might be a better treatment op option for you that's currently in a trial. And I know, again, with non-small cell uh, lung cancer, it has become standard of care to when you're biopsying to make sure you have enough adequate tissue for this biomarker testing, but not necessarily in the small small cell lung cancer patients. So that's where um, these conversations with experts um, specializing um, are, are so, so important. So what types of clinical trials, I'm, I'm being mindful of time, um, are available for patients with small cell lung cancer and what, what type of promise are they showing? There's some extraordinary stuff. I mean, so um, so first of all, just to make the point of how much is happening. This is not yet really something that's happening on any kind of scale within small cell lung cancer. But right now, in other cancers, there are studies where um, we are editing people's DNA. And, and that's often with cells that are pulled out. But, but just, I, mean, I think that the general public recognizes what an extraordinary thing that is when we're talking about editing the DNA uh, of cells. Uh, but just just to make the point that um, that there is a lot happening and a lot in the works. That's not yet a big thing in small cell lung cancer, um, but but it makes the point. And, and that is, I expect, coming at some point for small cell lung cancer like it has in other cancer types. Uh, but right now there are studies, um, and, and this is not just small cell, but antibody drug conjugates is a category where essentially 
Um, it's an antibody, so something that binds to the receptor of a, a cell, uh, and it has a linker to what's called a payload, which is often a kind of chemotherapy. But what this essentially does is binds to the surface receptor of, of uh, and typically it's a receptor that's really on cancer cells, so that it gets pulled into the cancer cell where the payload gets released. And essentially it's a way of delivering the chemotherapy into the cancer cells rather than just giving it as an infusion that goes everywhere throughout the body. And so these are drugs that tend to be pretty well tolerated. The side effect profile is really very good in these because it's really a, a focused treatment of the chemo. And there are trials within small cell lung cancer uh, that are antibody drug conjugates. There are other trials that are with immunotherapy. Uh, and so um, I have a couple of these trials open where we've really seen some extraordinary responses in, um, so these are patients that have already gotten chemotherapy and the immunotherapy drugs that we, we talked about earlier and the, the cancer grows. And now uh, um, there are a, a, at least a couple of different uh, um, drugs where they're binding, it has an antibody so that something that binds to the receptor of T cell, so in the immune system, and binds to the cancer cell. So it essentially pulls the cancer cell and the immune cell together and then creates that immune response. And, uh, and so again, then we're seeing patients that have an immune response um, that then fights the cancer. I should say, I didn't really say this earlier, but the immunotherapy drugs we, we described earlier, dervalumab and atezolizumab, that are approved in the first line treatment of extensive stage small cell. These drugs are not uh, toxins. They're not something that harms cells. In fact, those drugs themselves don't treat the cancer, but what they do is to help the immune system recognize the cancer so that the immune system actually fights the cancer. And um, these drugs I'm describing now that have a bind to the T cells, the immune system, and bind to the cancer cells are also creating that immune response uh, to the cancer. So we are seeing some people that are having a, a really nice response. Now in the immunotherapy I described earlier, um, that is part of the first line standard of care with extensive stage small cell. What I had said is that it's a fraction of patients that really seem to get that, that benefit, but that benefits a home run. That, that some of these people are really having years of control of their cancer and, and often with minimal side effects, thankfully. It's not to say no, that's not to say there aren't people that sometimes have more in the way of side effects, but as a broad statement, I can say uh, um, often minimal side effects. And with this, these studies now, where we're creating that immune response, we're really, uh, hopefully, we'll see these really lasting for years, although, although this is still uh, uh, studies that are ongoing. Uh, but those are two different classes uh, of drugs that we're seeing in trials. Now, but there are more. I mean, there are other pathways that are being treated um, and, and and this could be an hour uh, long uh, talk in itself. Uh, but and then that's getting back to these array of treatments. When we subtype out um, small cell lung cancer, is that is that something where we'll see some of these drugs work better for some subtypes than others? Uh, this is ongoing work. And I think it's important to note, and I know we talk about it here at GoTo all the time. Um, it's important to talk to your, your your physician about clinical trials, right? Because in order for us to to to, um, to, to generate discovery and new op treatment options for lung cancer patients, we need people to join these trials, right? People. So I think. Um, go ahead. I see you. Yeah, breathing. I mean that's absolutely true. It, I I also always stress to people um, that when we're talking about any treatment for that individual, including trials, it is only within the context of what's good for them. That mm -hmm. we do not do treatment trials for people in the future. Um, that, um, now, you know, sometimes there are studies where we say, oh, can we collect another tube of blood or something like that for doing studies to hopefully develop something. But when we're talking about a clinical trial and rolling on a treatment trial, I only talk about what I think is the best option for that individual. And even on the trial, if I think for whatever reason that's no longer their best option, I will take them off the trial. Anything we do from a treat one standpoint is about what is best for that individual. We of course hope that the treatment works really well and therefore goes on to help other people, but but it's not about other people. And, and, and people, I mean, for any patients watching, 
any treatment you get should be all about what is best for you. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and I think uh, similarly to some patient fears around um, chemotherapy or, or side effects from treatments, it's the same here. People are afraid um, of the old you know, sugar pill or, or placebo. Can you talk a little bit about how trials um, are run today and how that's very rarely um, the way it's, it works? Yeah, that's such an important point. Thank you for thank you for specifically bringing that up because that's right. I mean, just like in the beginning, I talked about the preconceived ideas around cancer. The preconceived ideas around what trials means is also often very strong, and people come in with the belief that trials are done when there are no treatment options, and that trials have they they have they might just get a sugar pill, which is not even treatment. Um, and, and both of those are not really the case. So. Um, in the the first line, we, you know, we discussed chemotherapy plus immunotherapy as being the standard of care now, and that's because of clinical trials that only only recently were reported out. And this was people got randomized to get the, the first line chemotherapy or the chemotherapy plus the immunotherapy. Um, in one of the trials, it did incorporate a placebo, uh, but that was the chemotherapy plus a placebo no one would be getting just a placebo. And that's a really important point. Any treatment on a trial is going to be at a minimum, the best standard of care. So there are trials where everyone is getting the study drug. Um, and that's only when we have data to suggest that this is, is likely going to be effective, where we're optimistic about this working for people. In a randomized trial, if they're get, they'd be getting the control which at a minimum is the best standard of care. So, um, so there aren't really trials where people would only be getting a placebo. It wouldn't be ethical unless there are truly no treatment options. And so I think this really comes from back in the era decades ago where we didn't really have treatments for, for cancer. And so we were comparing, uh, I mean, I say we, but this is before my time, but uh, um, we as a field were comparing uh, placebo because there weren't known treatments with a treatment, but we're so far beyond that right now. Yeah, thank you. I I, I always try to clear that up because I think it is a reason that patients don't uh, look into clinical trials or even want to have the discussion with their physicians. Um, also being mindful of time, we've got three minutes left and we have so much more we could be saying about this. I think to your point, we could go on all day about um, not only the treatment options, but I think some of the things um, from a patient personal standpoint that roll into being diagnosed with uh, small cell lung cancer and stigma, I think, which plays a hu huge role in that. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get you back live here in the living room to, to, to have some deeper dives into that type of thing, as well as multidisciplinary care. I think that's another piece that um, is also important, having your um, care team pulled together, having conversations about what is best for you. Um, another thing um, that I wanted to give a shout out about is GoTo Foundation began an initiative um, specific to small cell lung cancer uh, last year with the goal of educating, uh, supporting, and engaging the small cell lung cancer community for improved outcomes and quality of life, just what we're, we're talking about today. I think um, you know, we've heard from our community, uh, our small cell community through focus groups, um, you know, that there are challenges around um, this particular subset of lung cancer, finding good information, relevant information, up to date information. They type in small cell, you know, Dr. Google, as much as we tell patients not to go there, they go. And when you type in small cell lung cancer, you have to weed through all the non small cell lung cancer stuff first to be able to find it. So we're working really hard um, by creating new education uh, materials and videos on staging, breakouts on immunotherapy specific to small cell lung cancer, a breakout of our comprehensive patient education handbook that's specific to small cell lung cancer, brain metastases, side effects, um, all that good stuff. Uh, we have a qualitative study uh, going on with Dr. Christine Lovely at Vanderbilt. Um, creating a specific landing page on our website, a specific online community just for those folks uh, with small cell lung cancer, enhanced content on our uh, registry and, and um, newsletter. So we've got a lot of great stuff going on. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, to be able to help sort of, you know, 
help you to gather a better understanding of what your options are and, and some of the things that um, Dr. Sands is talking about today. I think um, some of the take home points are where I'd like to close with and, and that is um, there's reasons to be optimistic. Um, second line therapies, research and trials, um, and, and Dr. Sands is very quick to say, please stay offline. <laughs> so I don't know if you no, have any well, final thoughts. Go ahead. I'm okay with people looking online, uh, but, but you should bring your questions into your doctor because there's just so much misinformation out there or stuff that really doesn't relate to your specific case. So just be in close touch with your doctor and, and feel empowered to say anything. Uh, you know, we just touched on stigma and I know people have a smoking history and there's often a guilt about that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter why you're here. You're here. Let's move forward. And, and you should always feel empowered to to communicate whatever you're thinking. Any questions, any comments? Yes, I, I, I second that. Well, we're at time. I just want to say thank you so very much to Dr. Sands for coming and talking with us today about some of these new and novel approaches to uh, small cell lung cancer, obviously to Medscape for allowing us this time during the virtual lung cancer conference. All of you watching live and all of you uh, that will come back and watch post live, Peninsula Television and the entire staff at uh, GoTo Foundation for all their support. Um, everybody enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully we'll see you soon. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see.